Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the kickoff lecture in the Spring School of Architecture lecture series. We've got an exciting event lined up for you this evening. My role tonight is just to tell you about the lecture series overall and uh, what's coming next Monday. And then I'll turn it over to Jonathan Klein. Here's the poster you've seen around the school uh, with the seven lectures that are happening this spring. It's, again, as always, Spike has done an amazing job finding talented and creative people to come to uh, talk about their work and their philosophy or architecture. I need to remind you that uh, this lecture series is made possible by a generous gift from the family of Alan H. Ryder. Uh, he was a graduate of Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture. In those days, it was Carnegie Institute of Technology, um, Cranbrook Academy, and run the Prize of Rome and studied there. Um, and worked in prestigious firms in Washington and other major cities. You can see the little image of the St. Louis Arch up there in the upper left-hand corner. That was one of his projects. So next Monday, February 5th, is the next in our series. Margaret Griffin will be here from Griffin Enright Architects here in Kresge Theater, same time, 5 o'clock. So we expect to see you there. And Tonight's lecture, of course, is Aran Chen, and I'd like to introduce Jonathan Klein to do the intros of Aran. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so I'll keep this short. Um, Aran Chen is the founder and uh, executive director of ODA, which is a dynamic and rapidly growing firm based in New York City. In just a short 10 years, uh, he's built a firm that is transforming New York through large-scale projects, as well as projects around the globe. Much of ODA's work focuses on designing everyday spaces of living and working uh, in dense urban contexts. And their projects take on the complex challenge that he'll talk about tonight of bringing um, um, our innovative architectural ideas, which often are not present in uh, kind of speculative work, uh, by taking on the zoning constraints, by taking on the conventions of real estate development, by really deep understandings of architectural typologies, and transforming them in ways that relate them to the city in different ways, create indoor-outdoor indoor, um, relationships that are um, transformative for those buildings. Many of their projects also um, engage in urban design and transform the spaces of the, the outdoor spaces, the spaces between buildings of their work, and engage with the city in innovative ways. In recent years, for those of us in Pittsburgh, we've been experiencing um, kind of a boom of higher density mixed use development than we've seen maybe in the 30 years prior. And some of that work is good, and some of it maybe less so. Um, ODA's work, for me, offers uh, an inspiring contrast to some of what we've seen happening in Pittsburgh. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce Iran Chen and Unboxing New York tonight. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Oops. Can you hear me OK? Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Spike, for arranging this and inviting me. It's a pleasure to be the first uh, uh, speaker at the series of 2018 lectures. And what I'd like to do today is kind of open a window to ODA's world, yeah, maybe into my world. In order to do this, um, I'd like to take you back in time, 10 years, to July 2007, when I was sitting with my lovely wife in our uh, one-bedroom walk-up apartment in New York City and discussing the prospects of me opening a, a design studio. My wife was eight months pregnant with our second child, you know, and with no life savings, two kids on the way and a rent. It seems pretty obvious very clearly that it's not the right timing. But I, I was carrying a burning desire to kind of change some of the typologies of, uh, of building in New York City, especially on the residential side. And a week later, I was sitting at the same room and reading the New York Times, and on the cover of New York Times Magazine, it was an article about uh, David Ajaya, you know, the British architect that came to New York, and I was reading it, 
And as I finished the last sentence, I shouted from the other room, I'm doing it! And that was it. There was no discussion afterwards. But really, six weeks after, Christian Bailey, Don Young, and Charles uh, were brave enough to join me um, and, and to follow me into opening ODA, Office for Design and Architecture. We did it in a small studio apartment on the Upper West Side. And the beginning was quite uh, good. You know, we got a, a serious project and a few small projects until somewhere in the middle of 2009, the phone rang and our biggest client called me and he says, uh, Lehman Brothers, who sponsors our project, uh, went down, went under, and the project is obsolete. And the next few days were very similar. We lost all of our projects in a matter of a week. You know, the big recession had started. We were 14 people at that time, and, and we were sitting around a table discussing what are we going to do now? And we discussed everything from, you know, creating courses on interior design. Uh, to opening a bagel shop downstairs. It was really a survival mode. If you look at all the points of the Dow Jones right here, look at where we picked to open the office, right? The edge of a cliff. So timing is not my best quality, I can tell you that. But we managed to survive weather the storm uh, by being nimble and pragmatic and mostly just by wanting it. And uh, today ODA um, is an office of about 80 uh, great uh, talented and fun architects. We have people from 28 nationalities, and we have projects in New York, but in different states and also around the world. So there's definitely transition here, and last year we kind of celebrated in a big party our 10th anniversary, and we said, how do we capture the transition, what happened to us in 10 years, our experiences and so forth? And we decided to write a book. And the book was not to be a monograph or showcase our project, but rather sort of a diary. Uh, that, that kind of shares our thoughts, our ideas, and our stories. And through the process of writing the book, we figure out there's really five elements that are persistent in their overlapping in our work, and that we believe are actually five elements that should be in the core of architects going forward today if we want to transfer, uh, transform the future of our cities. The first one is living. Living is really our motivations. What do we care about? What keeps us awake at night? What is it that as architect we believe in and we want to change? Zoning is the understanding of regulation, not a very sexy uh, topic. But what seems to many as, uh, as uh, handicapping for us is inspiring. Developing is recognizing the worlds of client out there. Guys, 90% or more, probably much more than 90. The majority of development that is done in the world today in big city necessarily is controlled by the private uh, sector. And so our relationship as a profession with the world of developer must change if we wanna, if we wanna carry change. Marketing is the way our ideas are communicated to the public and building is really our understanding that what we shape as a community and society shapes us. And so what I'd like to do today is I'm going to go over three of those topics and use our projects to kind of ex express our ideas. And hopefully at the end of it, you'll see the overlap between them uh, that is what defines us. So I believe that if we're not going to do anything about it, this is the future of our cities. What's wrong with this picture? Everything, right? Well, I believe that there's three principles or human, uh, human uh, uh, needs that directly are connected to architecture. One is to see far and beyond, to open the window, to look above, to climb up the mountaintop, to sit by the ocean and see the, uh, the, uh, the view. The second one is to be shielded and protected. The third one is to live both inside and out. And the last one is to be connected to others. We're social animals. And unfortunately, if you take the four elements, the overlap of these four elements barely exists in modern cities, definitely barely exists in New York City, and we really wanted to do something about it. So what we do, in lack of better words, is we call unboxing the city. What it means is really we try to find different dimensions within the otherwise extruded box that can accommodate uh, those changes, what we call vertical village or other qualities. What we do is we, we try to find the, uh, the breathing room 
of a building, meaning to what degree it can extract and compress in order to create new territories by which we can expand our life into. And what we're hoping uh, to find by doing this is many things, but um, three of them are what we call is vertical village, which is really living both inside and out, but also protecting our privacy while creating communities. Avoiding dead ends, you know, dead ends is the feeling I had as a single in New York. When you come in you, to the lobby, you enter an elevator and you end up in a dead box looking at a wall. And I guess if you're very lucky, you end up in a dead box looking at a view, but it's still a prison. Reclaiming lost space, what is it that we do with the space that we as architects reclaim or we take as we build new buildings? And what does it do to our communal space? in the city at large. So we're doing it through diversity of projects in ODA, different typologies, different programs. But I want to show you today uh, just a few examples. And the most explicit one, perhaps, is a building we designed in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, where very typically to Williamsburg in Brooklyn, you'd have a box with a base. The base is retail. The body of the building is what we call the base of the building, and then the penthouse. The penthouse is where the rich people go, because usually a place like this would be shared by two to three people that enjoy a huge terrace. And we thought, can't we expand that in a different way by which the outdoor space would distribute it or trickle to rest of the, the apartments? And so the entire building is a penthouse. So we did what we always do. We expanded and contracted the building. We checked the breathing room of that building within the given envelope to check the, the, the new territory that we might uh, discover. And we came up with basically three typologies, one bedroom, two, two bedrooms, and a studio. All of them has a corner living room and a corner bedroom, and also has a terrace that is spill over, spill out from the living room, create privacy, but yet the, t the territory, the area that is defined by the void between the street and the building, those canyons, is an area that is controlled and belong to the tenants of the building. This territory is valuable. And so in a way you can say that the life of the city, the way it is, kind of, kind of uh, find their way into the building in a way that would maintain people's privacy but at the same time expand their life experiences both with the outdoor and with others. So even the smallest apartment could open up and, and come out to a substantial terrace. We cut those sections at the front of the buildings to start to discover the potential activity that this territory can, can maintain. And clearly, uh, my guys at the office are having really fun, especially with the guy who's, who's dunking in the uh, basketball here. But the reality is that unless we search for these territories, we're not going to discover them. Another simple example is with a project we finished recently uh, on Park Slope in Brooklyn. And beyond the fact that most of the apartments have a sub substantial outdoor, the way that the outdoor is organized in a cascading factor, define a zone, again, a space that you can see between the, the, the stepping balconies and the, the territory of the street. And that area, that zone, we feel is communal, it has value in the depth uh, uh, and our ability to expand our lives. And so, you know, about six months ago, we've taken our entire office before the building was completed to try to experience it ourselves firsthand. And this is what uh, came out of this.
well, in any event, you know, we, we were hoping that this, this video would be given to the, uh, the new tenants of the building as a guideline of what to do, like playing football from the terraces. Um, but the funniest part is really this. Uh, you, you, I got to tell you this story. After the building was open, it was quite successful commercially, and I got a phone call from the New York Times, and, and, and you know, we're always responding very favorably to the New York Times. And the guy calls me and he says, I want to talk about this project. And for half an hour, we discuss open spaces and dead ends and community and vertical villages and the whole thing. And then, you know, a week later, this came out. Stroller valet service at a Park Slope condo. That's what, that's what came out of all this article. Um, I find it funny because the reality of some of our ideas as architects, the way that it's sold to the public and communicate to others is, is quite different than what we had in mind. I want to take you to Toronto, and we've been asked to design a building uh, at the front of Ontario Lake, and how do you deal with increasing density, right? These are all small projects. And here we had to kind of pile 300 apartments that could be equivalent to, to two or three city blocks into one uh, building, we felt a strong disconnect between downtown and, and the lake. And so we came up with this formulated plan that is, is basically just an L-shaped uh, tower with a double-loaded corridor, but the apartments are tilted on their axis, 45 degrees, providing corner views, and then each floor is kind of skewed along the column line in order to provide substantial outdoor space, essentially creating this community of penthouses. And so the building kind of responds to the light from the south and the view is almost like a flower. And we, we thought really carefully about the ability to maintain uh, privacy while balancing uh, community and definitely uh, uh, the idea of outdoor space, indoor, indoor space in, uh, overlap. So what happens when the scale grows? And you know, buildings are built today that are 1.5, 2 million square foot that can accommodate 2,000 apartments. And we've been asked to design some of those build buildings. A developer reached out um, about a year ago and said, you know, we want to build the biggest residential development in San Francisco. And it's going to have about 1.5 million square feet and about 1,600 apartments. And you know, how do you start even? And to what extent are ideas about expansion and contraction can save that monster? Well, the one thing about San Francisco is that it's basically living sort of the city context is very low rise and it's very communal based that, you know, if you take 3,000 apartments or 2,500 apartments, they would constitute a, a, a neighborhood. And in that neighborhood, you'd probably find a park and maybe a coffee shop and a dog run and maybe some other communal things that would serve this particular community. These are the amenities that help uh, unite this community. And I thought was, can we take that idea and flip it 90 degrees, or basically build that community vertically? Can we maintain the same elements that you'd find in a small neighborhood like this and build them as a tower? So what we decided to do is kind of break the circulation into two cores. We could do one central core, two cores that actually connect in five different places, connects the two area of the buildings through the communal spaces. And in the communal places, we had a range of programs from an outdoor pool and outdoor gardens to indoor lounges and coffee shops and lounges, what have you. And so there's no situation of a dead end within the building itself. One could enter one lobby, cross through the, the pool, go up, cross through the lounge, and, and, and so on and so forth, which does not, in our mind, detract from the energy and the volume of the activity at the street level because the density increases in that corner and in the future will continue to increase to a great degree. And so, what we've done is manipulated the form or actually stretched the form in a way that would define those spaces, like the arch define the volume of air that belongs to the community of the building just by the nature of its being. I want to take you back into New York for a second and talk about reclaim uh, lost space. I think it's a, it's a huge topic for us. It's probably a huge topic for many architects. 
As somebody who operates in New York City, I get it all the time. There's no more land, right? The, the, the space is maximized. Where are we going to go? City of New York has no more outdoor space. And the funny thing is if you look at the map of New York City from above, 30% of the open space is underused and underutilized. And you know where it is? It's in the core of this New York City block, in the courtyard. So if you look from above, when you walk down the street, you see buildings. But in reality, all of those buildings have courtyards inside them. And in the best case scenario, the courts are used, the courtyards are used for uh, small private outdoor spaces for some tenants. So it's highly bifurcated and it's not continuous. But most often than not, this is like mechanical spaces and storage for whatever and garbage piles. So that's, you know, that's, that really bothered us. And so when we had an opportunity to design a big scale project, we wanted to address that, that concern. So, you know, we were approached about two years ago to design a huge project in Bushwick. Bushwick is a neighborhood in Brooklyn. And what you see on the left is basically the map of Brooklyn today. It's of Bushwick today, I'm sorry. It's very fragmented. Uh, it's this compiling of different typologies of architecture and has a lot of intimate small scale to it, which really, you know, draw peoples to it. But the zoning in the future calls for a typical New York City grid which would create those courtyards inside city blocks. And we had two. And so we thought, can we overlap the two things? Can we overlap the small scale of, of, of Bushwick as it is as a neighborhood today with the idea of the mega block of New York City and create something that perhaps has two of those elements together? So the first thing we've done is we said, okay, Let's build a park in the middle of our site, and then let's extend the park into a series of courtyards that are interconnected at the ground level. And then let's connect the roof and create a huge park for the community of the people who are coming. So essentially, the roof of the building is 60,000 square foot of greatness. We literally have a mile bike lane at the top of the roof. We have a pool urban farming facilities, dog runs, what have you. This serves the community of the building itself. And underneath at the ground floor, we expanded the public park into those courtyards and it's open to the entire community at large within Bushwick. And so one can say that our expansion, our reclaim of open space is actually doubling up. It's just that it's more defined, it's designed, and it's specified for the usage of the people who would live both in the building and around it. So my, something that might look like a typical uh, city block inside is very much more fragmented where the landscape park is spilling over into the courtyards, incorporating art and other uh, activities from amenities to retail to community facilities, et cetera, et cetera, while the roof is uh, a little city of its own. And we have to overcome some of the, the blocks that developers has, have in their heads. For example, on one hand, on the left, we're gonna have the, the building's pool, which is accessible only to the, the dwellers of the building. On the right hand, we're gonna have a coffee shop that is open to the public. So they're gonna have more security elements, there's gonna be a, a car reader, et cetera, but at the end of the day, it's nothing you can overcome. So in the topic of reclaiming space, I wanna go a little smaller and tell you um, uh, a little story. We, we've designed this, this really big project that is the biggest affordable housing project in New York City. It started construction now, it's been going on for a while, and it's gonna have, again, about 1.5 million square foot. And at the front of the building, we had a little communal garden that we loved. You see that little green space at the front? This was fantastic. And then recently, the city came back to us and they said, can we accommodate in that garden a public library that would serve the neighborhood? Amazing, I mean, we'd love to do a public library. That's a great commission. But we love that little park. Do we have to choose between the two? So. We started thinking of a library as a canopy, meaning a canopy that exists above the park and perhaps the relationship between the two can start defining an outdoor space that has different quality to it 
And by merging the canopy to the ground, we've basically created that form. It reclaims the exact footprint of that garden. But it's basically or essentially floating. And then the, the legs that are touching the ground would be the entrances and the exits and everything underneath it would maintain an open space, but it has its own character and would sort of carry a certain type of uh, activity. Which leads me to another project that was a real challenge for us. There's a new typology that was invented in New York City, the Slinder Towers, I'm sure you heard about this. A small piece of land that is equivalent to a side of one apartment is extruded endlessly to new heights and becomes a needle in the sky. This is a topic that, generally speaking, is very controversial for many reasons. I don't want to go into it. But when we were asked to look at that, we thought, what, what can we do with that typology? There's nothing we can do. It's a dead end, which we hate. It has no connection to outdoor space at all. And it has a morphology that has no human scale to it. But then we thought the one thing that the, uh, New York City allows you to do in, in, in sites like this is go as high as you'd like. So if you go high, let's go higher. And basically, we stretched the program of the building beyond its program. So the building is stretched to create basically gaps inside of the building. The gaps only carry the core and the structure, nothing else. And in those gaps, we envisioned private gardens that relates to the apartments, either above or below them. So essentially, we're reclaiming the lost space seven, eight, nine times, but if you have, if you're lucky enough, and you can afford it, you can buy this one unit and have either up garden or down garden that is the size of your apartment itself. It's basically like a suburb house with a backyard and front yard. Now we worked really hard to make sure that this is protected from the wind and I'm not gonna get into it, but it's actually a very good environment to be in. I don't know what I think about it, but I think that at the end of the day, the typology, the new typology of a stretched tower and the gap within it might create a new language for residential tower that is different from an office tower, for example. And that typology could become an anchor for thoughts of how we look at future buildings. Which now, uh, I, wanna, I wanna share with you the last project. Um, we have recently won this international competition to design a very, very significant large project in the Netherlands. And it's been about a year uh, by which we've been working with the city on it. But there's a few very interesting things about it. First of all, it's gonna be the tallest residential tower in the Netherlands. You know, uh, Netherlands is built on water. To build a, a significant tower is a challenge by its own. But then it sits, it's situated on one of the most important historical uh, structures um, that has been kind of empty for quite some time and the city was, th was thinking what to do with it. So the first thought that came to mind had to do with the cluster of Dutch courtyards by which you know, private homes, each one is slightly different, around, arranged around a, a communal garden. And can we start envisioning those houses finding their location within the vertical uh, tower? And so we've used the generic arch as, um, as a component that exists in the historical building to basically repeat itself in a random way that expresses uh, individuality and community, expressing the fact that the tower is gonna have endless amount of typologies of apartments with very different types of outdoor spaces, and that the, the territory between the indoor and the outdoor is that buffer zone, is that sponge that belong in, and is shared by the tenants of the building. And so essentially, it's sort, of, it's sort of a sponge building by which the inner core is glass set back from the outside, which is, a, is an extended garden. The breaks in the middle, uh, by the way, serves as the amenity spaces that are shared between the different tenants. Which then leads me into the next topic, zoning. Everybody loves zoning, right? 
You guys have waited for that. So let's say that we, we, we know what we like and we have our purpose and we know our principles and we know we've rewrote our own chapter as living. But can we really execute all of these things within the zoning regulation of a city like New York or any other city for that matter? Can we even foresee in our head being able to articulate that level within a regular zoning regulation of a typical city? Well, the answer is yes, but it's not easy. You know, in 1916, the first book of zoning was written in New York City, and then it expanded to other cities around the country. It only had 14 pages. And the most interesting part was in section 19 when the purpose of the zoning was written. And at the end, it says the purpose is a promotion of the public health, safety, comfort, convenience, and general welfare. What's wrong with that? That's fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with that. It was 14 pages. In 1961, it was 539 pages. And today, in 2017, it's 4,000 235 pages of pure joy. <laughs> Numbers, diagrams, charts. But let me tell you, my friend, something. If you as architects are not gonna be familiar with the zoning regulations of the cities by which you operate, if you're not gonna at least understand the principles by which they are built on. The only thing you'll be able to build is what the zoning book is showing you as the morphology for buildings. And frankly, this is what 99% of the building in New York look like. And as architects, we have, the freedom, we have the freedom to design the facade. But if you take it as a challenge to embrace zoning as part of the tools of design, if you say that by understanding it, we can then embrace this as an inspiration for what we do, we can probably do some things. And I wanna give you just two examples. The first one is simple enough, it's called the dormer rule. And a dormer is an area binded by a triangle that allows you beyond the setback line to bring some area back to the front of the building. Clear enough? That's the gray area. Now. The idea of dormer came from the traditional dormer that brings light, light, light into the uh, gabled roof. And New York City brought that idea in order to create some sort of um, uh, more even distribution of outdoor spaces at the top. But what we found out, surprisingly, is while the zoning rules define how do you measure the areas, it does not tell you to keep it there. While for years, building has been built in New York City with triangles, things like this, because that's what the zoning book says, but the zoning doesn't say that. We've actually discovered that once you calculate the area, you can put it and shift it wherever you like, which was great, because it allows us, it allows us to create a territory we call we call vertical village, that territory between the face of the building and the setback, it allowed us to distribute outdoor spaces in greater amount and in more interesting way. It allowed us to design different apartments at the top, each one is different. And so that's what we've done. And 15 Renwick Street, the building that was completed for about four years in Soho, has that expression. So if you look at the dormers up there, they arrange to maximize the potential of each one of those apartments to provide privacy yet outdoor spaces. And for example, this corner is an apartment that acts as a house. It's a duplex. It had three outdoor spaces. The piano room is overlooking at the uh, living room garden. The master bedroom and the living rooms are coming out. And the experience is a three-dimensional experience, both visually and physically that belongs in a house, usually does not belong in a city like New York. So the funny part is I wasn't so sure that the zoning allows it. And, uh, but I did many things that I wasn't sure about. But I called the zoning attorney and I said, you know, what do you think? It says this, it doesn't say this. It says, let me get back to you. So he reads through all of the zoning and it says, 
I gotta tell you, I can't see any place where you can actually distribute the zoning, as you say, that prevent that, but I've never seen this done in New York. You're taking your own risk. And uh, we did, but now if you walk in New York City, look at new construction and see what happens. This typology starts to repeat itself and many architects have embraced that. And so basically what started as a dormer providing light into a cabled roof and then zoning created those tiered area, we called it a flying dormer. And the flying dormer allowed freedom and flexibility and perhaps creativity. Let me show you one, one more example. Looking for my water. Setbacks. You know what a setback is, right? A building needs to set back as it goes up in New York City in order to provide light into the streets. That was sort of the generic idea that really shaped New York City the way it is today. But uh, let's be real, it has nothing to do with the orientation of the building, right? Sometimes it does provide light, sometimes it doesn't. Like if it's in the north, if it's in the south, it's, it doesn't matter. So the interpretation of what setback means is to us very interesting. It has a few inherited qualities to it. First of all, when a building setback is where the value is. You know, Park Avenue, all blocks, setback, very expensive apartments. So the value is always at the top. Second, you know, from a construction standpoint of view, it's not that simple. You have to set back, you have to set back your structure, MEP, you have to change your layout. You have the dormer thing to consider, and then the distribution of the outdoor spaces is really relied on the amount of setbacks you have. And so, uh, a few years ago, we designed this building, completed about a year ago, in Long Island City, right across from PS1 in MoMA. The zoning was typical. Base, setback, dormers. You see that? That was the, 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 the genesis of what we had. But then we discovered that in this particular zoning, if you don't have buildings right next to you, one of those layers could set back. So meaning, we don't necessarily have to keep a maintain the, the street wall, we can set it back. And then create a generic box. And if you divide that generic box, you can build a very simple building with a simple grid. And then we came up with a system by which we have one bedroom, two bedrooms, and a studio that are plugged in. But every time they project beyond the envelope, Right? They create a corner window and they create an outdoor space on top of them. And that system gave us a lot of flexibility. We can basically arrange those like music notes however we want it. So you can say that the, the, the facade is a direct relationship to the layouts. It's not just the composition of a material is the way the layouts are is the expression of the facade. And the amount of outdoor space that is given back to the building is double the amount of the footprint of the building itself because there's overlap between those outdoor spaces. And essentially it's a very simple building that was built on a very tight budget, um, became one of the most desired one in Long Island City because of the qualities that it brings, and this is a project with a tight developer, with tight, tight timing, everything was, was really strict about it. So you see the transformation from what is a, a typical New York City uh, zoning uh, to basically this building and the section uh, to maybe kind of fantasize of the craziness things that could happen there. Now what I like in particular, because this building is right across from PS1, PS1 is the, the MoMA extension in Long Island City. And if you haven't been there, they have a courtyard at the front. And in that courtyard in the summer, there's parties and exhibition spaces where architects create different structures. It's quite an amazing place. The extension is made of concrete and then the building starts a dialogue with that building. That brings me into another fun project topic, developing. So we have our ideas, we wrote our chapter about living, we mastered the zoning, now who's gonna pay for all of this fun? If 90% of the development that is being, or the, the construction that is being done in the world today is developments, it means that 90% of you guys are gonna work with them at one point or another. Get over it. 
Our profession has been basically resenting developers for the longest time. They're the enemy of the states. Why? Because they all care about money and we only care about quality and that doesn't work together. Well, I disagree with that. I think that if this is the reality and our environment is shaped by the private sector, we need to embrace it and we need to find ways to work with it. We need to educate our client. We need to understand them and their motives to be able to perform. Now this is a chart that is the Bible of every developer. It's basically articulating every floor, the gross area by zoning, the actual area, the efficiency per floor, and the sellable amount of area. Sellable, the most important part, right? And this should be our Bible as well. If we build an efficient building that developers don't like, how exactly we're gonna build anything? At some point, we sat down and we thought about this topic, and, and if you look at a typical building, right, base to top, there's an equal distribution of area, but the values change as you go up, right? We know it. Real estate is worth more as you go up. Well, the other thing that happens when you go up is the quality of life expands. You can have more, uh, more glass area per square foot. You can have a bigger roof for community. And so essentially, if you take a typical New York City tower, that has the quality at the end for at the top for only a few, what happens if you flip it on its head? The majority of the area would be up at the top, which is good for us, us architects, and it's definitely good for the developer. So when we had this project in the Lower East Side on Norfolk Street some time ago, the original site is here, what you see here on the upper left. It's a mid-block building, 50 foot, front to the, to the street, front to the back, and the, the solid wall on the side is what's called the party wall. We don't have legal light and air. That's a typical building. We thought about it, and we proposed to our developer to go and buy the air rights, the light and air from the neighbors. Lights and air is basically their development rights that they're not using. Pay them, buy them, and then two things happen. First of all, this dead facade now become a live, live facade. You can have legal light and air to the side. The other thing is we've taken all of these air rights and we push it up to the top, creating value. And furthermore, the roof becomes three times the size of the original building, providing private and communal outdoor spaces that is great for the tenants. And so the lobby at the bottom became three stories tall because we've taken second floor and third floor apartment, pushed them to the top. And numbers talk. We convinced the developer that there's so much more profit in this that he upgraded the finishes of the building and allowed to build something that otherwise a developer might not build. So as the project was sort of unveiled a few months ago, it, it became more evident that this is a really win-win situation. The apartments were sold much higher than the projections. It was a huge commercial success for us. Uh, we thought that the qualities that are brought in the top of the buildings are fantastic. Zoning allowed it, even though it was complicated to get it approved. You really need to understand what you're doing. And perhaps a mid-block building become a new typology in New York City where the roof of those old buildings became the amenity spaces for the building themselves. So we claimed so much outdoor spaces for the benefits of, uh, of the development. So, I'd like to finish with a, with a personal story, if, if I may. Uh, about a year ago, I found this drawing in my drawer, and this is a drawing that I've done on my fifth year in school, as in architectural school some 25 years ago. And I remember quite clearly that the inspiration for me for this project was just remember as a memory from my childhood. So let me tell you, I grew up in, in Israel in a southern city called Be'er Sheva. And I remember clearly that our childhood neighborhood was basically three row buildings around a courtyard. And the courtyard was in the perfect proportion. It was big enough to get lost in, but it was small enough to feel intimate with the buildings. And our life was really in that courtyard. Then, as a child, after school, we would just play there. And I grew up to a single mother 
who worked very hard, and every day she would come home at around five o'clock, and she would make dinner, and then she would go out to the balcony and call me to come home. But instead of calling my name, she would whistle. It's like an ancient ringtone. Now it's strange, right? But the stranger thing is that all of our friends and all of our, everybody, all the families had their own whistle. And around five o'clock, I remember this as it was yesterday, all of the mothers would go out to the balconies and whistle to their kids to come home. And the courtyard would be filled with sounds, a symphony of music, and we know that the day's over and we go home. And that profound memory as a child really inspired me as a student of architecture in my fifth year I envisioned a larger portion of the city, almost like an urban scale, where the hierarchy of the programs are going to be rearranged. The houses are going to be at the top, like private homes around courtyards. Below, there's going to be communal spaces, and down at the bottom, the retail. And it would act like a sponge, so it has a huge breathing room. Light would come in through, uh, uh, through the articulation of it. There's no going to be dead ends. It's basically a continuous loop of circulation. And... Um, you know, and residential would be on private homes on that mutual gardens, et cetera. And it struck me when I saw that so many of these ideas find themselves into ODAs today. This is basically what we're doing right now. And this was 25 years ago at a studio. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know anything about, about uh, vertical village and dead ends or anything about zoning or developers. And I want to leave you with that thought, guys that what you do right now as students, what intuitively you put on, it, on, on, the, on the paper, in your case on the computer, is actually going to define you as, uh, as architects in the future. And I can only recommend you to pay close attention to what you do today because that's going to be your living. This is going to be your, your I believe. And be very resilient to make sure that the complications in life are not preventing you from executing these things so you can actually change the world. And I want to finish with the three Fs. Find your ideas, follow your instincts, and fight conventions. Thank you guys for listening. I don't know if we have time, if, if people want to have a question, ask questions, but uh, I'll be happy if you turn on the lights and then we can maybe have a conversation. Yeah? Good? Okay. I'm just going to get some water. All right. Any questions? Yes. Um, so from, from what I can tell from your work, you kind of see the, the built environment as being made up of these discrete units that you get to arrange. Um, how do you manage to keep continuity within your buildings? Like continuity of, of form, how you arrange these pieces into, into larger mm. holes? You mean continuity between different buildings? In the same building. Well, I think it really relates to the typologies and program. I was asked, and many people asked, oh, so this is your style, you're doing these cubes and stuff. No. This is a form that we came to by the fact that we're doing residential buildings and the form of an apartment and the form of what's an efficient room. But when we start doing other typologies, like the library, or we're doing mixed use, or we're doing bigger, uh, bigger projects, the forms might totally change. So, we're not married to any particular form or style, rather to an idea of the of, of sort of the expansion. I hope that's answered the question. So obviously how you have revolutionized how we use space in cities, this is very important going forward with um, sustainable design and how we can fight kind of the growing urban trend where space is very minimal. So how do you think this method can be used in affordable housing? Well, first of all, some of this project, and none of them that I presented today, are pure affordable housing projects. And uh, in New York City, you're actually required with the large uh, rental projects that at least 20 now, 30% of them are affordable. 
Um, so, you know, you can do it on any type of project. The question is, can you find a way for the developer to do it and why? Basically, right? The one thing about affordable housing is very political. I think that the solution, personally, I think the solution of affordable housing by building them separately in, in class C uh, neighborhoods uh, with class C type of architecture is just maintaining the problem, actually making it worse. And frankly, the idea of incorporating percentage of affordable to every project makes sense to me. Developers hate it. But if the incentives are there for them to do it, they'll do it. And that, in many ways, solves many, many problems. Because you don't build a separate typology for affordable housing. You incorporate affordable housing with your everyday buildings. And I support that. Can you explain some of the structural challenges that you have in creating some of the forms that are really unusual, like the building the arch and the library? Yeah. Um, let me start with, with, with the more simpler typologies where we kind of move in, move out. That's very interesting. First of all, it's more complex from a structural standpoint of view. However, we try to bring logic into it. In New York City, um, most of our projects that has in and outs are limited to about eight feet. And eight feet with uh, poured in place concrete with eight inches of slab can carry itself without additional reinforcement. That's already a revelation, right? You can go out, you can go in, as long as you're within eight feet, it's not going to cost much more money. Um, but definitely, as it becomes more complex, it becomes more expensive. The question is what you gain and what you lose. The structure in San Francisco is absolutely complicated, because you would have to basically build the two sides of the building, build the bridge between them, and sort of hang the rest of the form underneath it. Uh, and, and now you're saying, why would any developer pay for it? And I'll give you the, 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 um, the answer. In this particular zone, the city of San Francisco have said the following. You're allowed to build up to 500 feet, X amount of floor area. But if by special approval we like your building, and we think this is a great contribution, we'll, we'll offer 750 feet and three more FAR. So there's always a balance of give and take. In this particular case, city is giving incentives, we can stretch the envelope, it's a win-win. Doesn't always work, guys, don't think it's that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you've talked a lot about how you have to work to accommodate the developers and try to convince them of your ideas and work with the constraints that they create on the process. Um, have you ever considered developing your own projects to buy the values that you have and kind of reap what you sow in your work? I've considered it. I was offered many times by developer friends see that you know see me as a, as a counterpart to to help them with analyzing sites and see what the maximum value is. But I'm very happy doing what I do as an architect. Extremely busy by doing it and and very profitable. Thank God. So I'm not looking to the other side, I'm not looking to be a developer, I'm leaving to other people who are better at this. But definitely, I see my, part of my goal is, is partnering and helping them, because uh, otherwise, you know, think about it, that an inefficient building has no really place in our new uh, cities for many reasons. You know, ecological is, is one of them. But, uh, so thinking the way that they think helps us as architects to pursue our goals. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. And good luck, guys.